Okay, so today we're trying something different. Um, anyone who's uh, worked with me knows that I get bored easily, I need to change things every once in a while. So, um, and also I, over the four and a half years that I've been here, I've just been meeting so many staff and hearing about their incredible work and in increasingly trying to find ways to profile that work and for all of you to share that work. I know you're all incredibly busy and you, you know, we hear a lot about the silos at BCIT. So this is just one way we thought, well, you're here anyway, we're feeding you anyway, so we might as well try and do another way of sharing uh, some of your work with each other. Um, this is also a reminder to pick up the newsletter as you go out and things like that, because that's another way that we share members' work. So today we've asked um, some of our members from, um, as you can tell by the room, from forensics, um, to come and speak to you about their work. Um, I do want to just, before I go on, say thank you to Jason Moore, one of the panelists who gave us all of the decorations, so thank you very much for that, and I don't know what happened to that person over there, but uh, there's some evidence hidden behind there too, you can check it out. Um, and then the other thing that I've done is I've invited an outside moderator to come in and moderate the panel. Um, when I listen to people talk about BCIT, a lot of the times they talk about what happens beyond the classrooms and outside there in the world. And so I thought it would be neat to have somebody come in from a different sector, and I've invited somebody in from the arts and culture sector who's a writer, who I'll introduce in a moment. And I thought it would just be nice to sort of see how these parts of this um, sector, this work, comes together in different ways. So what's going to happen is I'm going to introduce the moderator, and we're gonna, then we're going to get the panelists to come up here. We've got some questions for them, to have some conversation with them, and then hopefully we'll have some time if you have any questions for them as well. So. And the moderator is Sheena Kamal. You can come up while I'm talking about you if you want. So Sheena was born in the Caribbean and immigrated to Canada as a child. She holds an HBA in political science from the University of Toronto and was awarded a TD Canada Trust Scholarship for community leadership and activism on the issue of homelessness. Sheena's debut thriller, The Lost Ones, you can pick up information about The Lost Ones out on our table, has been sold in over 15 countries and is a Globe and Mail bestseller. Kirkus Review, which I learned recently is where you want to get reviewed if you're a writer, has said that The Lost Ones is a gritty, violent read with a tough, idiosyncratic, dryly witty heroine that readers will root for even if they wouldn't want to invite her home. <laughs> Sheena has also worked as a crime and investigative journalism researcher for the film and television industry and has essays published in The Guardian and The Irish Times. She lives here in Vancouver and enjoys beaches, and like me, loves dark and stormies. So come on up, Sheena. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Kyla. And uh, I'm not sure when the last, it was, I guess the last time that I've been in a room with people who had actual jobs where they had to put on pants and leave their houses for a living. This is rather new to me, um, so thank you guys for having me. Um, so Kyla keeps on, I guess she wants me to talk about the relationship between forensics and what I do, which is write crime. So I write about murder, mayhem, but I make it all up. And the bane of my existence is literally, like, and I'm being literal here, is literally science nerds. And not just science nerds, but wannabe science nerds who have watched an episode of CSI and is like, oh, that would never happen in real life. And you suck and you're not a good writer. So that is why I have to at least be kind of aware of forensics. I am not a science nerd, but I have to pay attention to these things. And I do my bare minimum, but I do it and it's because it's important and this is, it resonates with people in real life and so that's, um, that's what it is. So The Lost Ones um, is a psychological suspense novel about a woman who discovers the child she'd given up for adoption many years ago has gone missing. And now she's got to um, delve into the very dark events of her own past in order to figure out just what happened to this missing girl um, who is a child that she never really wanted to exist in the first place. So I'm going to read you from the first chapter, read to you from the first chapter. It's very short. So if you guys just get bored, um, there was something? I don't know. <clears throat> the call comes in just after five in the morning. I'm immediately on guard because everyone knows that nothing good ever happens this early. Not with a phone call, anyway. You never get word that a wealthy relative has passed and is leaving you his inheritance before 9 a.m. 
It's fortunate, then, that I'm already awake and on my second cup of coffee, so I'm at least moderately prepared. I've just come back from my walk, where I leaned over the edge of the seawall and contemplated water that is calm and gray, just like the city itself at this time of year. As usual, I tried to see the warm, dark current that flows from Japan and turns into the North Pacific, tempering the cold and spreading its tepid fingers to the coastline. And, as usual, it refused me the pleasure. Vancouver. Some people say it's beautiful here, but they've never idled in the spaces that I call home. They've never been down to Hastings Street, filled with its needles and junkies. They've never considered the gray sky and the gray water for months on end as rain pours down in an unsuccessful attempt at cleansing. Then comes summer, and it's so hot that you can roast marshmallows on the fires that burn through the forests in the province. Summer, right on the coast, is nice enough, but still several months away when my phone rings. I stare at the unfamiliar number on my call display and, after a moment of hesitation, decline to take it. Several seconds later, it rings again. I'm intrigued. I answer, if only because I've always admired persistence in a caller. Hello? There's a long pause after the person on the other end explains in a hoarse voice why he's calling. The pause becomes awkward. I can tell the caller is fighting himself, wanting to say more, but knowing this is a bad idea. No one wants to talk to a rambler over the phone, especially one you've never met before. I imagine the caller sweating on the other end. Maybe his hands have gone clammy. The phone slips from his grasp and I hear it clatter on the ground. He swears for a full 30 seconds as he struggles to pick it back up and regain his composure. You still there? Did you hear what I said? He asks. Yeah, I heard, I say, when the silence has become excruciating. I'll be there. Then I hang up. I've never heard the name Everett Walsh before, but according to him, I may know something about a missing girl. He does not tell me what, though. I consider not meeting him, but he sounds desperate, and if there's one thing that draws me more than persistence, it's desperation. Even though finding people is part of what I do for a living, what would I possibly know about a missing girl to warrant a call at this hour? His desperation is so fresh and raw, I can almost taste it. Okay, that's the first chapter. Thank you. Okay, and I think we just did what I'd like to invite our panelists to come on up. Oh, okay. Do you want us to sit in any order? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so first up, we've got Sheila Early. And Sheila is the recent recipient of the first Visionary Award from the Canadian, Canadian Forensics Nurses Association. Sheila has been a practicing registered nurse for four decades. Her nursing specialties have been emergency, emergency and forensic nursing. She's the co-developer of the first sexual assault program in BC, developer of the fir first two-year part-time classroom forensic health Sciences Certificate in Canada. That's a mouthful. Um, Sheila is also the first Canadian to be elected the president of the International Association of Forensic Nurses. She's also a founding member of CFNA. Um, and next we have Tara. Tara is a BCIT trained registered nurse and forensic nurse examiner with her specialty emergency nursing working in two local emergency departments. Through her forensic work, Tara and her colleagues created Fraser Health Human Fraser Health's Human Trafficking Healthcare Initiative huh, to improve identification and response to human trafficking. The team's major project, the creation of Human Trafficking Help Don't Hinder, online learning is online learning for emergency healthcare providers and has trained thousands. This training is the first of its kind in Canada. Tara is a principal investigator conducting research and has developed curriculum on human trafficking for multiple institutions, including BCIT. Tara has volunteered abroad in Thailand with tribal children who were at risk and trafficked, which was the catalyst of, to this work. Okay, we've got Jason. Jason is a faculty member at BCIT who works in the accredited BCIT Forensic DNA Laboratory. In this role, Jason has been extensively involved in forensic DNA testing, quality assurance, research, and curriculum development as the lab at BCIT utilizes the latest uh, forensic DNA technologies 
Jason is always updating the two forensic DNA courses he teaches at BS BCIT to ensure that students get real industry-related hands-on experience before entering the workforce. Um, and then finally, we've got Aaron. Aaron is a faculty member in computing with a secondary appointment in forensics. He is an NSERC funded researcher specializing in artificial intelligence with applications in trust and information security. Increasingly, his research also touches on the emerging ethical and social issues. Um, prior to coming to BCIT, Aaron was a software engineer and research analyst um, in MDMA, MDA systems, not MDMA, that's something different, um, <laughs> where he developed decision support systems for the Canadian military. Aaron's role in, uh, in the forensics department is primarily to supervise student projects and to develop curriculum that keeps up with the rapid rate of exchange in the computing sector. So can we have a hand for our panelists? Okay, so first up, and this is for all of you, so you can just pass the mic as, as you uh, go along, um, is what motivates you guys in your work? I guess because I'm holding the mic, I'll start first. Uh, you know, back in the day, in the 90s, and yes, I have been a nurse for over 40 years, I, as I fell into the component of healthcare that relates to forensics by accident when I decided uh, that the care being provided in my emergency department to someone who had been sexually assaulted was the same as what I had actually provided 22 years before. There seemed, seemed to be something wrong with that picture. Um, so. I decided that somebody had to do something to provide better patient care. And that's what still motivates me today, 25 years later, is to provide pa better patient care. Now that I don't do it with my own hands, I teach others and educate others how to do that. And it means that every single one of us in this room is, is sooner or later touched by some sort of violence or trauma. And uh, health care needs to be part of your healing process. Um, what motivates me first and foremost is always my patients. I unfortunately get to see people um, on their worst day and uh, hear about their experiences that all of us would not be able to get our heads wrapped around. Um, I find that they have an incredible strength and courage and that's a huge motivating factor for the reason why I do the work that I do. And uh, once you experience that and you hear the stories and the voices of your patient, it's not something that you can just walk away from. So it does become ingrained in lifelong work. And I think um, as a community member and, and a mom myself, uh, there's a moral and ethical responsibility when it comes to working with violence and, and violence-related situations that um, we can always know more. And, and when we know more, we can do more. I, I think I'm one of those science nerds that can't watch CSI that you're talking about. Um, Don't read my yeah, book. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, what motivated me to go into forensics was I was uh, at UBC doing science, um, not necessarily because I was, I was interested in it, but not totally, but like, um, not, and I saw a presentation on forensic science and then I thought, oh really, this is great, I can uh, qu incorporate my education in science with an interest in forensic science. So that's how I got started in uh, forensic science. And I was uh, an uh, um, alumni of the program here. Um, and uh, what I like about forensic DNA is that um, there, there's com the companies, there's a few companies that make products and there's a lot of money to be made. So they're constantly evolving their technology so that uh, you can get um, better DNA profiles with less and less input starting DNA or degraded challenging samples. So it's interesting to uh, stay on top of that and, and stay current with the industry and as well as, you know, making a difference in terms of helping identify who committed a crime or um, we work with the BC Corner Service, for example, helping identify a missing person with their family reference sample so that they can have some closure. Um, okay, I'm. I'm. Uh, I don't work with blood in actual crime. I, I work in a with a computer. Uh, my background is doing artificial intelligence research, uh, so I guess I got motivated to get into this side because um, sometimes you wonder if what you're doing is helping people anymore. Um, so you know, there's a lot of bad talk about you know why are we making intelligent systems to do this or intelligent systems to do that, putting people out of work. Um, 
and on the security side and the forensic side, uh, I feel secure that I'm that I'm helping people. I'm doing something for for the for the social good, and there's a lot of interesting problems, uh, just sort of uh, technologically and mathematically, that sort of keep me engaged with that. Okay, thank you. So now then, since you have the mic, maybe we can uh, talk to you first and then kind of go back down. Um, what, oh, how do changes in the field of forensics change the way you teach into this program? Yeah, I mean, for me, that's, uh, that's a really direct relationship. Forensic, uh, so digital forensics technology is changing all the time. So sometimes you get a, a new piece of technology and you want to get some data off it. That's what a lot of our students do on the digital side. They, you want to recover data off of something that somebody was holding when they committed a crime or their computer at their house. Um, but sometimes new stuff comes out and we get a student who says, I want to retrieve some data off of this new Fitbit and we have an old um, device that it can't actually connect to. So um, you actually have to constantly keep up with changes in technology to do anything useful on the, on the digital forensic side because uh, they're just pushing products out all the time and, and retrieving data and, and actually analyzing that data. Uh, is sort of a constant struggle. <clears throat> For forensic DNA, it, it's updating as well with like the new kits that I'm talking that I mentioned earlier, or the latest uh, journal articles. Maybe not as fast as digital forensics does, but um, in our lab, we're always trying to, as we do DNA testing and um, new stuff, uh, new products or reagents or software comes out. Um, we're trying to uh, get that software or the, those reagents incorporated, validated into our system so that we can then have the expertise to teach our students uh, in the, the DNA courses as well um, so that when uh, um, they can have the hands-on experience with that so that when they go to industry, they, they have a better chance of getting a job in industry and also uh, already understanding how the, the system works in industry as well. So the area that I specialize in is human trafficking, and um, human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar business that's going to surpass guns and drugs um, in our lifetime. And so you can imagine that um, the sale of people as commodities is going to be an ever-changing industry. Um, and so in a, as smart as we get um, in regards to combating this crime from a healthcare perspective or a judicial perspective, uh, the traffickers, I don't want to say they're smart, but they um, will find another method of operation. And so we continually have to look at how people are being exploited. What does this look like? Um, what would that look like, you know, in regards to the healthcare industry and, and how somebody presents? But also, uh, more importantly, and, and an area of, of great interest to me, is how do we prevent this crime from happening in the first place? So um, what are the intervention points? Um, and, and are those ever changing or are they stagnant vulnerabilities and stuff? And that's an area that's um, in great exploration right now. Thank you. When I look at the f uh, being a nurse for decades, I, I never thought that I would be part of forensic science and have a, a really a codependency on what Jason does and what all the other forensic scientists do because they make an impact on how I performed my job and how what I teach now. So DNA, as you, uh, I, you know, it was 1986 when DNA came into high profile, if you want, and it was a case out of, out of England. And since that day, it has become the only forensic science that is without question. Uh, you know, have you heard the term junk science? Well, there's a lot of things that aren't <coughs> as true as we thought they were. So for me, it, the most important thing is to stay updated on all the things that are accurate. And that is DNA. And in fact, I, you know, it's become the important thing when we're looking at violence and trauma when it goes into the, cr the criminal law process. Because the courts respect the knowledge of the forensic scientist to determine what that DNA actually means. But it is the healthcare provider, i.e. a forensic nurse, who actually does the recovery process of that physical evidence. So we're tied, and, and, and thank goodness. I work in the Forensic Sciences program, and it, I couldn't find a better home. Oh. <laughs> Just in case you need it. Sure, yeah. Now, um, that's interesting that you mentioned that, because John Oliver recently had an episode on forensics, and he talked a lot about DNA and just how 
um, it can be misinterpreted and, and how important that relationship is between the healthcare provider and the people collecting the DNA and the actual court systems to understand that and, and that it's a constantly shifting sort of process. Um, so, well, since you're so right here, uh, maybe I will ask you then, um, what is important for students to know about the changing ways in which um, the three components of law, so enforcement, judicial systems, healthcare, and forensic sciences, deal with sexual assault? Well, that's an easy no-brainer for me. <laughs> Two things. One is that as healthcare providers, we didn't realize the impact um, that of what we did on a, our patients and on the criminal justice system as well as the legal process. You know, back in the day, and I have to say that because I've been, in my first time in emergency was 1970 when I cared for a patient who had been sexually assaulted. Uh, it was like, oh, police officer, you can do whatever you want here, you know. Uh, you you want to be in the room with my patient? Okay. Uh, you know, you need a documentation? Yes, here it is. That is not the way it is today. And that was a huge learning curve for healthcare, the legal system and the judicial system to realize that we each have our own field. Um, we overlap, we have different mandates, but we all have a common thread, that individual, who to me is a, a patient, to the legal law enforcement, it's the, the victim, usually, um, sometimes the perpetrator, and to the court system is the complainant. It's all the same person. And how we have to interact as interdisciplinary as possible. Because I can be an advocate for my patient as a nurse, but I cannot be an advocate for that patient in the judicial system. My, my benefit to that patient is to be non-judgmental, to be neutral, to be unbiased in how I do my role as a forensic nurse. So it means that I have to wear two hats at the minimum. And how that process affects the, the person who has been the subject of, of sexual violence is that the more we cooperate as three different spheres in our community, the better it is for our patient overall. And we're trying to turn the most awful day, as, as Tara said, into one of the days where that person walks out the door of whatever health care facility they were presented to better than when they came in. Right. So, Tara, when you're working in uh, the hospital setting, what do you notice that you want to actually bring to the classroom to your teaching? Um, when I'm teaching, I primarily use the experiences of my patients, and I try to, um, in a confidential and sensitive way, of course, uh, I do a lot of case study teaching. Uh, because human trafficking is so elusive and it's so out there that people cannot get their head wraps ar wrapped around that this is actually a real thing that's happening in Canada. And there's a lot of myths and a lot of ideas that we have around it uh, that are perpetuating the crime, uh, you know, allowing it to happen uh, right in front of our faces. And so if I'm able to bring the experiences of my patients and, and display that through a case study and we can break it down and learn from those in regards to how do we identify, how do we care for them, um, how do we respond to these patients, it's actually a very powerful way of learning. Um, and I've also had many patients that have actually asked me to tell their story. So, you know, these are, these are people that have gone through extreme trauma. Um, I would never ask them to go out and, and tell their story if they you know, unless they wanted to, but um, many of them feel like their opportunity would be a good learning point for other people, and they wanna, most of them wanna help other people and prevent this crime from happening again. So uh, I'm very privileged in my position to be able to tell their stories. Thank you. Um, so Jason, what, what actually goes on um, at the BCIT forensic lab? So our DNA lab, um, accepts samples uh, for testing services uh, <clears throat> from various agencies, either police agencies or one of our main clients is the, the BC Corner Service. Um, so we get question samples in, uh, try to extract DNA from the sample. Um, if we are able to extract DNA, um, we do a process to amplify the DNA to get more of the DNA called PCR. And then we get, a, at the end of the day, we end up with a DNA profile. And then from that DNA profile, you can compare that to uh, reference samples, either 
Uh, if it was like bl blood at a crime scene, then you're looking at suspects and you're looking for a direct match. Or if it's a BC coroner service sample, maybe it's a, a child of the parents and you're looking for a, a father, son, or mother, son, daughter relationship. So we're trying to uh, develop DNA profiles, um, make matches, and then uh, we're talking about um, DNA kind of being considered a, a gold standard. One of the reasons for that is uh, um, uh, part of the DNA match, you report a statistic. So you say, you know, this is the profile and this is how common this profile is in the population and how often you'd expect it. And usually um, now the statistics are quite high, so it's quite, quite uh, rare for that match to be from another individual. I think that's some of the issues that some of the other forensic science program um, disciplines are having is how do they uh, put a statistic on a fingerprint match, for example, or um, like a bite mark analysis, some, some of these um, sciences where um, people have been convicted in the past and now they're going back and looking at them and saying whether or not uh, that person's actually innocent or not. Yes, that was in John Oliver as well, and I yeah. found that very interesting. Um, Okay, so Aaron, uh, when you you teach in the computing, you teach in computing and forensics, which um, is also a mouth, mouthful. You guys are not taking it easy on me today. Um, could you actually talk about what connects these two fields, both in the industry and in the classroom setting? Uh, sure. Uh, we've been talking for uh, seems like decades about uh, ubiquitous computing, right? The idea that we have computers all around us and computing devices on our person. Uh, you know, your smart connected devices and your fitness trackers. So in terms of forensics, when, you know, you look at a crime scene like that one, um, Jason's uh, sort of branch, you know, swabs the blood and the other stuff and, and gets data from that. Um, but what computing has to offer is there's a bunch of other stuff there. There's a bunch of devices that have been collecting information the whole time, uh, locations, activities. You can tell, for example, um, if somebody's fired a gun from their fitness tracker data. But you need computing people involved because the way that um, it actually involves analyzing data in a kind of a complex way and understanding how it's stored. So there are uh, microphones sometimes that to save um, storage data, they, they, they shut off uh, when you're not making noise. Uh, rather than recording like, a, like quiet, they, they don't operate they, at all. Um, and that becomes inadmissible in court because people say, well, this microphone, although it's actually trying to be efficient, um, is not producing legally admissible evidence. So there's a lot of, um, you know, in order to actually use any of this data, you need computing people involved that understand how it's being collected and, and can represent and, and reproduce it appropriately. Thank you. And so this one, this is our last question, and it's for everyone. What is the biggest misconception about your work? I'm not going to answer this long. I, I will say as forensics as a field, the, the, um, the, I think people always think of it as just the, the DNA side. And uh, so I will mention there's, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on. And uh, Patrick Neal was supposed to be here who does uh, criminal intelligence analysis, which is another aspect. So there's, there's a bunch of um, you know, other stuff beyond the CSI thing that, that actually is involved in forensics research. More than just science nerds. More than just science nerds. Cool. Got it. <laughs> Um, so one of the big misconceptions co does come from the CSI show where um, people think that the people at the crime scene will also then go back to the lab and analyze the data and, and the people in the lab have guns and, and it all ends in one hour. Um, that's probably, uh, even, yeah, we have, uh, we used to have high school camps for CSI students and they'd be really into CSI and we would put the CSI shows on at lunch and then by the end of the week they like stop want to stop watching it because they realize how unrealistic it is <laughs> and how tedious you know actual forensics is at times <laughs> taking notes and everything at the crime scene um, that's one of the main things I think you mean it's not just sexy frowning yeah. that's not oh <laughs> um, I think probably the most common one that I get is that people think you automatically work only with dead people um, but in, in our line of work, I'm sure Sheila has a million misconceptions here because this is like a full day. I remember this being a full day course when I took it from her, <laughs> the myths and all this. Um, but that there's still a lot of myths out there about sexual assault and uh, who's being sexually assaulted and that, you know, it's primarily only females. And um, they're surprised to hear that no males actually do get sexually assaulted as well. 
Um, and there's a, just a lot of general misconception about violence in our community and how prevalent it is. So that's, uh, that's the barriers and the, and the myths that we try to break down through our work. I think from the beginning um, of the word forensic, they think it's pertaining to dead people and not the law. It actually means pertaining to the law. Uh, that's one of the misconceptions, but I also think the biggest misconception from my perspective is that healthcare doesn't play a role in this. And it is actually the beginning entry point for any changes within uh, violence and trauma recovery, is that first point of entry is usually a healthcare provider. So all healthcare providers need to know the fact that they play a role in the recovery of that individual, whether they are the subject of violence, crime, or trauma, either from a victim perspective or from a perpetrator perspective. So violence is universal. So therefore that leads us to believe and understand that the cure must be universal as well. Violence is preventable and we each have to have that role. It's always not my area. Well, you know what, I live in Surrey and believe me, it's my area. And so when I see a drug dealer doing dealing drugs somewhere, I report it. Um, the misconception is that you as an individual don't have a role here. You do. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being part of this panel. It's been very instructive for me because I'm an outsider and so what you have to say is very informative and I'm, I'm really glad that you took the time to come here. And thank you guys as well for having me. So, yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. <sighs> All right, any questions from the audience then? Question for Tara, how prevalent is human trafficking in BC? Um, well, oh. The problem with human trafficking is, is that because it's so elusive, it's very difficult to quantify, which is, has been an extreme challenge in healthcare for us to be able to get people to understand that um, it's a healthcare concern and that it's a legal concern. There's a, a lot of, uh, it intersects every facet of somebody's life. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, I, when, I, when I instruct, I never give statistics about how, you know, like we've got a thousand people or we've got this or that because it's grossly misunderstood. There's not enough research behind it and it would be completely um, invalid uh, for me to say that. But what I can tell you is that it's a pandemic and that in Canada, um, our, our uh, human trafficking is just as prevalent as any other country. It's happening in every single community of, of our country. It's happening to every kind of person that you can imagine. Um, kids are being trafficked out of their homes with stable parents. Uh, we have a disproportionate number of Aboriginal women and girls who are being trafficked across our country and, and are currently missing um, and being exploited. Um, and so it's, it's very, very prevalent and it, we can do something about it, but we need to know more and people need to be educated about it. Any other questions from our, our audience? Oh. Thanks, and uh, Sheila, I was thinking about what you said that everyone can get involved in thinking about our students. Obviously, the Be More Than a Bystander program here at BCIT is excellent, and kudos to all the faculty and staff who are supporting that, um, and other work that the Student Association does as well. Can you think of uh, anything else that would sort of um, be a catalyst in raising student awareness, or do you think there should be more awareness on the campus about uh, violence and sexual assault? Well, thank you for bringing up the be uh, more than a bystander because I'm, that's something that's very interesting and I'm very proud that BCIT was one of the first on board with that. Uh, and the catalyst was actually university, the United States universities who have no knowledge of that sexual assault happenings. I think one of the things that would really help is uh, reporting statistics. And I know statistics can be manipulated. However, um, who wants to send their son or daughter to a facility that has a high rate of sexual violence? So I think one of the things that we need to do is make sure that all awareness campaigns are on multi-levels 
you know, we might be teaching, you know, we might be speaking to the converted here when we're talking to females, but what about the males? What about males uh, uh, of any gender or any sexual orientation? There is still difficulty in someone disclosing that this happened to them. I see the numbers still remaining the same if you want. You asked about statistics. One in 10, maybe, report. So that means on this campus, if we have one person report, there are nine others who didn't. We need to get to those nine others. And again, repeating awareness, awareness, and, and having faculty being aware of something's going on with a student. That's the other issue, you know. Uh, I used to go out to high schools and speak to like grade nine, 10 classes. I could spot in a minute where I don't, this had already happened to them. So having faculty and instructors being aware when there's a change in your student's behavior, is there a reason for it? The ones who drop out suddenly, like the good students who suddenly drop off the map. Uh, females who suddenly disappear out of the woodwork or change in your classroom. Uh, outgoing student not being outgoing anymore. The male who suddenly becomes disruptive why? Because they hold a lot of hurt and anger, and they haven't disclosed the reason why. So awareness, awareness, awareness. It's kind of like location, location, if you were selling uh, a home. It's keeping all of us, faculty, students, everybody on the alert that there is more to each individual than what you see, and you need to maybe take the time to find out why. Thank you. Thanks for the question. OK, anyone else? All right, I think that's, that's us for today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you to Sheena for moderating, to all of our panel. You can find out more about the Forensics Program online, about Sheena's work. You can purchase her book. I will not because I need to sleep at night, <laughs> but other people can. Also, if you want to be up here with some of your colleagues and talk about the work that you have, um, just let me know. We'd love to do this again. I have gifts. There's some more here. Bed umbrellas for everybody. So there you go. Take the umbrella, pass it down. There you go. Um, so again, just thank you once more to all of them.